where do we get starch? Starch is actually a form of storage carbohydrate. So since it is a, a, a type of storage carbohydrate, it will be found in the storage organ of the plant. And in, in uh, human being, starch also, excess starch also will be stored. If we eat a lot of carbohydrate, a lot of, a lot of starch, you cannot consume and use all the starch to convert into energy. So the excess starch will be also stored in our body. In what form? Hmm? In what form? Fat. Before that? Glycogen. Yeah? So excess uh, starch will be stored as glycogen. But in plant, the starch will be stored in the storage organ in the form of what? Maybe tubers. Tubers or roots like potato. So this is an example of starch from tubers or roots. Potato starch, sweet potato, potato tubers, cassava in the form of roots, cassava or tapioca, okay? arrow root. Okay? And another form of storage is in the form of, like this one is cereal. So we have many examples, a lot of commercial starch actually derived from cereal sauce. Corn, rice, wheat, barley, sorghum, oats. Okay? And uh, another form, our own sagu starch. Somebody said in Emodo, I am quite, I, I'm, I'm quite uh, 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 happy to see the, the interaction and the discussion about how sagu pump looks like. So you, you made me smile, actually. <laughs> but it's good. Yeah? Someone said the uh, sago palm looks like oil palm, oil palm tree. Someone said look like coconut tree. So, but I don't blame you because maybe most of you, uh, you have not seen the actual sago palm. Yeah? Uh, but if you ask me, it looks more like probably coconut. Yeah, Wendy? Have you seen the actual sago palm? Okay, um, but it looks more like, but anyway, it's actually, uh, the, the starch here is actually stored on the, in the trunk, okay? in the trunk itself. In Sarawak, uh, one sagu palm, one sagu palm actually one, uh, can go up to what, 15 uh, meters, yeah? and it can, uh, we can um, process to get the starch uh, we can get from one uh, trunk, we can get around 200 to 250 kilogram <coughs> wet, wet starch, wet flour. But if you go to Papua New Guinea or certain part in Indonesia, we go to this virgin jungle. Nobody has explored that jungle because uh, most of the sago grow wild. So one sago palm actually can produce maybe what, 100, 100, uh, 900 kilogram, almost one ton of starch. Yeah? So it's a very rich source of starch. And therefore, uh, Malaysian government and now Indonesia actually, they want to exploit this as one of the uh, export uh, crop yeah, to, to produce. Now Sarawak is still the biggest exporter of sago. But soon probably Indonesia will overtake Malaysia. Just like uh, palm oil, yeah? Malaysia now is not the biggest exporter of palm oil now. Indonesia is now. Because they have a bigger land, they have a cheaper labor, and Malaysia is very generous, transfer all the technology to Indonesia. So now they have become the, bigger expo uh, the biggest exporter. Malaysia now is the second one. Yeah? Anyway, these are the source of commercial starch. Commercial means here the starch is being now produced in large quantity. But actually we can also get starch from, theoretically, from any type of plant. Any part of the plant. Not only in the storage organ, even in the leaf. Also we can find some starch. Yeah? Um, 
uh, skip water extraction. Uh, by the way, this, this photo was taken when I was in Japan, Hokkaido. I visited um, a starch factory during a very cold winter, and my digital camera was running out of battery. I was shaking actually, very, very cold, very, very cold winter in Hokkaido, but managed to take a few photos of starch processing. You can see the heaps of mountains of potato there. Yeah? In Hokkaido, they grow a lot of potato and basically will be processed and finally we get the starch to cut the story short okay but please uh, read uh, more eh, on this one uh, and very briefly let's learn about let's learn about the how the starch is synthesized actually if we learn how the, process, the how the starch is synthesized in the plant it's really we can see the you know, the, 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 the beauty of nature. If you believe in God, you know. You see, uh, starch is a, a type of storage carbohydrate. It is synthesized actually from an abundance of energy. We have the sun, you know, the sun actually um, we, is a form of energy. And we have a lot of energy that we must be able to capture and store because we cannot use the, the energy from sun uh, easily. So we have to store it in some form so that later if we want to use, we can convert that back to the energy. So this is what the process of photosynthesis that you learn in the primary school. It's a really, really a powerful and beautiful process designed by God, by nature to transform energy, the sun, the sunlight combined with carbon dioxide, combined with water, and in the plant, it is converted into a complex polymer called starch. I'm not going to say more about photosynthesis because you are expert probably by now. But during the biosynthesis, during the making of the starch, we, have, we need carbon dioxide, we need water, we need uh, the sun as the energy, and we need also a variety of enzymes. A lot of enzymes actually involved in converting the, the various components into, uh, uh, from glucose yeah, as the simplest monomer, and the glucose will be link will be connected through some chemical bond, alpha-1,4 glucosidic, alpha-1,6 glucosidic, and it will become bigger and bigger and bigger, become a big polymer, and it will be converted into a form of small, discrete granule. So starch actually present in the form of discrete granule. Okay, as small as one micron, as big as 100 micron, average maybe 30 to 60 micron, but some starch actually even less than one micron, very, very, very tiny uh, granule. And the synthesis or, or the biosynthesis of starch actually occurs when you, when we sleep, yeah? and also during the daytime. So during the night, some of the starch is converted by the enzyme to sugar and transported to other parts. During the day, when there's a lot of sun, light, carbon dioxide, and so on, during the day, the starch is synthesized in the leaf, in the leaf. So, from glucose will become bigger polymer, okay? But a bigger poly, a big polymer, which is starch, cannot be transported easily to the warehouse, to the storage organ, because it's a big polymer. <coughs> so during the night, it, the starch will be broken down 
into a smaller sugar and transported, transported down to the storage, storage organ, tuber or roots. This, this is like a warehouse. Lah. Huh? So that's what happens. During the, the day, it will be synthesized in the leaf. Then during the night, it will be transported and stored in the storage organ. Okay. So during the day, the starch is formed as like intermediate form, transit. So we transit to airport. So we call it transitory starch. It's not really you know a very big polymer yet. Only temporary. Then during the night will be broken down again and transported back, uh, transported to the storage organ. So during this process. A lot of enzymes involved. Many, many enzymes. So chloroplast is where the synthesis of uh, starch occurs and will be stored in the ameloplast. So in this, if you look under microscope, this is actually light microscope only. That's how it looks like. So the starch is actually uh, stored in the form of granule. Okay. And these are the I don't want to go into details of this, but this is basically the synthesis of starch. The glucose unit is linked through, connected through chemical bond, covalent bond alpha 14 and alpha 16. And some enzymes actually involved to produce a long, straight linear chain, which is the amylose, and some enzyme involved to form the branch. Okay, so we get alpha one six here and alpha one four. Oh. <laughs> okay, I think you are very familiar with this uh, structure, the chemical structure of glucose, right? In this form. So this is the uh, straight. Uh, projection of the glucose molecule. We have six carbon, and this carbon number one. Glucose in the present actually in the ring, in the ring form. Okay, and this carbon number one, and this is a functional group C H O also known as CHO, a functional group known as huh? carbonyl group. Carbonyl group is C O, double bond O. CHO is and L the high. Uh, see? You have forgotten your organic chemistry. I know you got an A, but how come you don't know what is CHO? Kalau ketone group macam mana? Okay. So now you recall. Eh? Uh, that's why you learn all chemistry, organic chemistry, this when, this where, and when you have to apply this. This is the L aldehyde group. In the solution, when we dissolve sugar, uh, when we dissolve glucose, okay, let's say glucose in this case, when we dissolve glucose in water, it will become a solution. And the glucose ring actually will open up in aqueous solution, in water. It will open up at carbon number one. And carbon number one is also known as No, me, rick, carbon. Never heard. Enomeric carbon. A N O M E R I C. Enomeric carbon. Tak pernah dengar ke? Ada kan? Mesti ada. Inorganic chemistry. Enomeric carbon. And you should learn this in IMG 203 for analysis when you learn about the properties of reducing sugar. Right. So why glucose 
has a properties of has a reducing property because when we dissolve the sugar in solution reducing sugar it will open up at carbon 1 which is the anomeric carbon and the anomeric carbon is actually an aldehyde group and therefore glucose will display or will exhibit a typical properties of an aldehyde any reaction of aldehyde will be shown also will be exhibited by glucose and among other things is the reducing property but anyway anyway uh, in starch the basic monomer is glucose or the glucose this is the unit that actually uh, we call it the, the, the building unit if you imagine a house the smallest brick that is the glucose okay and it will form a ring structure and this ring structure not close forever in water in uh, in solution it will open it will open up at C1 that is the basis of all the reaction of glucose do you know that from glucose we can get hundreds of different chemicals you can get gluconic acid from there you can get uh, finally you can uh, get Ajinomoto, the monosodium glutamate, everything, everything can start from glucose. D-glucose is also known as D-glucopyranose. Yeah? If you can recall what's the meaning of pyranose and furanose, go back and uh, check again your chemistry. But most importantly is the active aldehyde group at C1. That is the basis of reducing property of glucose, and all the chemical reaction can occur here. Okay. And this carbon number one, the H group, when, when it is connected to C number six, the H and the OH can change position like this and like this. So you can get alpha and beta configuration. So we have alpha glucose, we can have beta glucose, and they show a different chemical properties. So C1 will react with C4 or C6. So we have C4 and we have C6 here. So it can form alpha-1,4 linkages or alpha-1,4 glucosidic bond or alpha-1,6 reducing bond and we have one reducing end. You see, we, we have one glucose, free, one free glucose, we have one reducing end. We have two free glucose, we have two reducing N. We have 10 free glucose, we have 10 reducing N. But we, when we connect them one by one through alpha-1,4 glucosidic bond like this, we have only one reducing N here. Okay? We have only one reducing N at the end. Okay? Because this, this N has been connected to that N. And that is important to understand. And this alpha-1,4 uh, alpha bond in glucose that form the starch would allow the, the polymer because um, when you have a long polymer, a long chain, it doesn't stay that, that way forever. It will tend to twist. It will tend to twist and form a helix structure. And the reason for this is because the starch chain wants to attain a stable thermodynamic configuration. So somehow the helix form actually give the stable conformation to the starch molecule so that it can arrange itself to form a more 
systematic, more ordered structure. Okay. Ah, boleh pula. So, we start from what? Glucose. We start from glucose and during the biosynthesis in, in the leaf, we have the enzymes, everything. Some enzyme will, 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 uh, will uh, help the, to, to, to build the, the long linear chain called amylose, and some will form a branch <coughs> chain called amylopectin. And this amylose and amylopectin, these are two separate, two different molecules, but they are actually will, will be packed together in a granule. So they will be arranged and packed together in one granule. So the linear chain of amylose and the branch chain of amylopectin combine together in one granule. Okay? So that is uh, what happens during the biosynthesis of starch. And what happens when you eat something containing starch? You eat the bread, the bread contains starch. Beginning, starting from the mouth, in the mouth, the saliva contains amylase. The amylase will start to hydrolyze the alpha-1,4 bond. Already the starch actually is being broken down. Then goes into your stomach. We have the acid, we have the, again, more amylase, amyloglucosidase will break down the alpha-1,6 bond. And finally, the starch will be broken down finally to what? Break down back to <coughs> glucose. And the glucose will be transported to the, through the bloodstream to various parts where it will be metabolized and changed back to energy. So imagine that the energy from the sun stored in the form of starch in the tuber, in the root, in the cereal, we eat, we, we convert that into product, bread, biscuits, spaghetti, noodle, whatever. We eat the product containing the starch, and now we want to break it down again so that we can get the glucose and convert the glucose into ATP into the energy, adenosine triphosphate. We get the energy. That's when you learn about all the crap cycle. Not crap, C-R-A-P. <laughs> ah, you learn about the crap cycle. We have to memorize the crap cycle, right? Yes. But do you know the significance of that? <laughs> ah, now you know. You have to convert that carbohydrate or starch back to energy. So can you see the beauty of nature? We trap the sun, energy, and we can store for how long? And when we convert into food and we eat the food, we convert that back again to energy. Just try to appreciate you know, how nature has been designed in such a way. Yeah? Now, the long chain of amylose, they will be twisted to form a helix. And that's how it looks like. The glucose, the glucose ring has to be in the, in the chair form. We call it chair. Bentuk seperti kerusi, right? You learn in organic chemistry. So in that form, only the chain, the long chain, can be twisted and form a helix. And one round of helix how many glucose units are there in one round of helix? Yeah? Six. Do not say six. So then it is six. <laughs> so six units of glucose per round. Then it will continue. And what will happen if you have a helix, just like a spring, and the cavity or the space in between the helix, in the helix. Here, the cavity inside the helix. So 
um, starch itself is hydrophilic, the OH group, because the OH group is hydrophilic. But the space or the cavity in the helix is actually because of the O oxygen group there, it become more hydrophobic. So any molecule that is hydrophobic, such as uh, emulsifiers or fat molecule or uh, long chain uh, hydrocarbon can be trapped and form a complex, form a complex with the amylose. And this is, uh, has its uh, significance. The ability of amylose to form complex is important to, um, well, to control some properties of starch. And we can take advantage of that. The ability of amylose to form complex has some implication and significance. It can influence the properties of starch. For example, we can add uh, emulsifiers molecule. You learn about emulsifiers in food ingredients. It can form complex with amylose. And therefore, it can reduce the retro or, or minimize or even prevent the process of retro gradation. So the, the bread will, will, be, will remain soft for longer time, increase the shelf life of the bread. If you remember in the school, primary school, you have a simple experiment. You drop uh, iodine on the bread or something. It will turn uh, black, uh, sorry, black, uh, blue, dark blue color. And that blue color is actually a chemical reaction where uh, the iodine form a complex with the amylose and form a blue color complex. So that is one simple test to show the presence of starch by using iodine. And uh, amylose structure is simple because it's linear, but it forms a helix structure. What do you think that amylose is really linear? Linear is like this, lah. Uh, you know, all of you sitting in the, this one row, straight, another linear amylose chain, another. What if we have someone sitting on your head, you know, start branching? So it's more complex. So that is amylopectin. Amylopectin is more complex. The structure, because we have, in addition to alpha-1,4, we have also alpha-1,6. So it start to branch out, just like the branch branches on the tree. Um, and because it start to branch, to form a branch, it has a very high molecular weight. Very high molecular weight. Very, very high. Among the largest molecule exists. Apart from cellulose, starch is also, amylopectin is also very big, complex uh, molecule. And the molecule, the molecule weight can be up to 10 to the power of 8. Yeah? Compared to uh, amylose, maybe around 10 to the 4 or 10 to the power of maybe 6 or 5. It's a very big molecule and it has a um, chain, the branches. And the branches is called uh, chain Rantai C or chain C chain, B chain, and A chain. You don't, you don't have to know very detail. But just roughly, because when you read any book on starch, when you read any, anything on amylopectin, you will come across this term, A chain, B chain, C chain. Yeah? So at least you know a little bit, very briefly. But that's uh, to, very simple. If we think of the amylopectin has a backbone, then the branch will be attached to that backbone. Then we have the chain that is immediately attached to the C bone, to the C chain is called B chain. Yeah? And the chain that is attached to the B chain is called A chain. As simple as that. 
But um, if we look at this structure, the the hmm, the we have the what we call uh, the inner structure and the outer structure. The inner part of this amylopectin is the C chain. And the outermost, yang paling luar, is A chain. And A chain is the shortest chain in amylopectin, followed by B chain and C chain. And why why is this is this is important because amylopectin actually can form a crystalline phase in the starch granule. Remember, a granule always contain amylose, amylopectin. These are the two big polymers <coughs> that form starch. The, the amylose is linear molecule, no problem. But the amylopectin is a big molecule, branch molecule, but it can actually form a crystalline phase uh, in the starch. In the starch, so starch, starch is actually um, is always described as semi-crystalline. It's not 100% crystalline. It's semi. About 30%, 40% is actually crystalline phase. And which component can form a crystalline phase in starch? In native starch. Native starch means original starch. In the in the in the tuber or in the cereal. Only amylopectin can form a crystalline phase, not amylose. Yeah? And which part that form the crystalline phase in amylopectin? So mainly it will involve the outer chain, the rantai A. The A chain is always very important. Yeah? So again, each chain will form a helix structure like that. And these are the alpha 1,6 chain. And each, each turn of the helix consists of six glucose units. And one helix and another helix will be twisted with each other and form a double helix. So this is what the scientists believe, the structure of amylopectin in starch. And it's not, it's not actually um, easy to really elucidate the structure of starch because uh, there are so many different techniques that we need to, to use until the scientists now able to deduce the structure of starch, polymer, the structure of amylopectin, the structure of amylose. The scientists has been Scientists have been very interested to study about the structure of amylopectin, especially because amylopectin is a complex molecule. So you can see, since 1937, there are Haworth, Stodinger, Mayer, Whelan, Range, Mikuni, and finally, not to say finally, but Hizukuri in 1986 or 8. <laughs> yeah? He came up with this structure which is now widely accepted. Hizukuri is a Japanese scientist. His lab is in the uh, University of Kagoshima. So I went there in 2000 to work in his lab. But when I was when, when uh, I didn't know that he, he, he has passed away, so when I went there, he just passed away for around one year, year before. So I miss, I, I, I didn't meet him, but I worked in his lab, which happened to be very, very small lab, actually. So we thought in Japan they have a very you know, good facilities, but actually our lab here is bigger. But their lab is smaller, but they <coughs> produce world-class world research. And this is a structure of, um, we call it um, cluster type uh, tree-like structure. Eh? 
proposed by Hizukuri. So we have C chain, B chain, and so on. So don't worry so much about that. But uh, all you need to understand is this. When starch is being hydrolyzed by acid or by enzyme, what happens during that process is actually the breakdown of the starch polymer. The breakdown of starch polymer means the alpha-1,6 and alpha-1,4 glucosidic bond is being broken down. So you can imagine each chain here will be sort of hydrolyzed and become a smaller chain. And that smaller chain will be further hydrolyzed. And if we allow the enzyme to react to the completion, finally we get glucose. Finally we get glucose. If we wait long enough. Remember rheology? Everything flows. If we wait long enough, But what if we don't wait long enough? We don't allow the enzyme to completely hydrolyze the starch, only partially. If we hydrolyze the starch partially, what do you think we will get? <coughs> Lihun? What do you think we will get if we hydrolyze the starch partially. Partially it can mean 50%, 60%, 70%, 20%, 30%. It, that's, my, that, that, that's the meaning of partially. Let's say we hydrolyze the starch to around 50%. What do you think you, we will get? Glucose? Maltose? Can we get sucrose? Can we get sucrose from starch? Andy, can we get sucrose from starch? Huh? Sorry? Correct, correct. Oligosaccharide, yes. But um, yes, correct, Lihun. We can get oligosaccharide. But um, just now I asked, can we get sucrose from starch? Can we get fructose from starch? Hmm? Ah. One million dollar question. Can we get fructose from starch? No. no. <laughs> that that sounds very confident. <laughs> okay. Who want to say who want to support uh what? Ah, Pekhun. Pekhun kata impossible to get fructose from starch. I say, I want to listen to Peck Hoon, you want to listen to me. I say possible. Have you, uh, yeah, we have, you have to put ingredients, can uh, You know about high fructose corn syrup, right? Or high fructose, well, they call it high fructose corn syrup, HFCS. Where do we get high fructose corn syrup? <laughs> starch. <laughs> From starch. We hydrolyze the starch. And we get glucose. Well, not 100% glucose, but high amount of glucose. Then we use enzyme. We use enzyme. I summarize. I uh, uh, I um, exactly. But it's a, a type of isomerized enzyme, which will I summarize the, uh, the glucose to fructose. But the starting material is starch. <coughs> when we hydrolyze starch partially, we will get a mixture of, yes, oligosaccharide and maybe some glucose, some disaccharide, some trisaccharide, some tetrasaccharide, pentasaccharide, hexasaccharide, octasaccharide, decasaccharide, oligosaccharide. 
around 20 glucose unit, maybe we can say oligosaccharide. If we have a chain longer than 20, what do you want to call it? Malto oligosaccharides. You must be familiar, should be familiar with these terms. Okay? We start from monosaccharide, disaccharide, trisaccharide, tetrasaccharide, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. Now, when I learned chemistry in Form 4, my Indonesian chemistry teacher, who was so fierce, <laughs> that's the first thing we have to memorize. If we don't memorize by the second day, we have to stand up on the chair. And that's Form 4. So we start to memorize. Mono, mono, <laughs> but after, between 10 to 20, we call it oligo. Saccharide. Above 20, we call it malto oligo saccharide. Okay? So we have to be familiar with those terms. Okay? So you have a mixture, mixture of as small as one glucose unit, as big as malto oligo saccharide. And that's what we have in glucose syrup. Glucose syrup or corn syrup. We call it corn syrup, or more general term is the uh, glucose syrup. Glucose syrup that we use in the chocolate, in the confectionery, in some bakery products, and so on. It was maltodextrin. Yeah? Maltodextrin. Name and, uh, we will learn later on the ingredients that we can, products that we can get from starch. But anyway, these are the, uh, the structure over the years. The scientists have tried to figure out how actually the structure of amylopectin. So now, more or less, we have accepted this as the model. But of course, if you read the literature on starch, there are now maybe um, newer models that have been, uh, that have been uh, proposed because uh, we have more and more sophisticated instruments now which can really, really study the structure of starch. Yeah? But for now, for this course at least, we just say this is the current accepted structure of amylopectin and can get even more <laughs> complicated but don't worry basically we have a helix structure this is the A chain this cluster one cluster we have A chain B chain and C chain another cluster another cluster and they are arranged in a systematic manner, in an ordered arrangement. So when we have something in ordered arrangement, we have a crystalline uh, structure. Yeah, we have a crystalline structure. So the amylopectin, the branches in amylopectin form an organized structure, which is uh, which become actually the crystalline phase in amylopectin. And what is the evidence? What is the evidence that amylopectin really have branches? So we cannot really see under the microscope that amylopectin has like <laughs> you don't see you don't see that under the microscope. We we have to use various uh, uh, analysis. Then from there we will we will make a, a deduction. We deduce. So, for example, from the um, HPAECPAD, this is a type of HPLC, but uh, this is high pressure anion exchange chromatography. It's uh, about half a million, the cost of the instrument is about half a million. We don't have it at USM. That's why I went to Hokkaido to learn about this technique. Yeah? And this is what I got beautiful result. And what's the meaning of this? When we use this method, HPSCC, high pressure size exclusion chromatography with RI detector, this one with PAD detector, and using these uh, state of the art detectors, we can see that actually, yeah, 
we get two peaks here. So this bigger peak is actually represent aminopectin, and this smaller peak represent amylose. And that small small branches, uh, sorry, the small small peaks actually we have glucose DP12, DP24, DP30, 40. This actually uh, represent or equivalent to the length of the chain C chain, sorry, the B chain and the A chain. Okay. But it's a bit complicated. Don't worry so much. The point that you want to understand here is this. All this method actually is a proof. It's a proof that amylopectin is a branch molecule. Okay, it's a, that, that's all. It's a branch molecule. That's what we want to prove here. Okay. So the comparison between amylose and amylopectin, I think I will leave it to you all to go through. But basically, we can say amylose is essentially linear. Um, amylopectin is a branch molecule. The molecular weight is very different. Yeah, the molecular weight and the degree of polymerization. Uh, do you know the meaning of degree of polymerization? So if I have 10 glucose in one chain, so the DP is 10. Okay, so that is the meaning of degree of polymerization. And we have to understand the differences between amylose and amylopectin because later when we learn about the functional functionality or the functional properties of starch, the difference in the amylose and amylopectin actually is very important. And this is where, why, potato starch has different properties with cassava starch. Cassava starch has different properties with corn starch. Corn starch has totally different properties with rice starch. Why? There are many factors. The granule size, the, 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 the molecular weight of amylose and amylopectin, the structure of amylopectin is different. The, the chain length of the branch in amylopectin is different from rice compared to rice and corn. And so all these differences would affect the overall properties of starch in terms of the gelatinization property, in terms of retrogradation property, in terms of viscosity, in terms of the stability during high temperature cooking, high shear cooking, low uh, high acid, um, uh, low pH, high acid condition, and, and so on. So the, the basis of understanding about properties of starch, first and foremost, is to understand the properties of amylose and amylopectin and the differences between these two molecules. Just like when we learn rheology, first we have to understand the concept of stress and strain. Here, to learn, to understand about starch, we have to understand the differences between amylose and amylopectin. The rest will be easy to understand. Okay? So, announcement. Our lecture on Thursday, uh, we have to cancel. Uh, um, but please, <laughs> happy or not happy, I don't know. <laughs> but please, um, Always, uh, when the lecture is cancelled, there will be some activity in Enmodo. So, I want to see more of you participating in the activities, sharing, discussion, helping each other yeah, uh, on Enmodo. Okay? So, I guess I'll see you all next week. Thank you very much.